Welcome to this next episode of our virtual tour of the Holy Land. Today we are in the desert at Qumran, close to the Dead Sea, where a community called the Essenes wrote what became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is also the place where John the Baptist may have lived for a period of time. You're about to hear about that from Hans. Our group is now gathering in a large tent at Qumran. But before we hear from Hans, we want to take you on a short virtual tour of Qumran. And then please join our family as we lead you in a short time of worship just before Hans shares. Okay, let's head to Qumran now. Welcome, dear friends, to the ancient site of Qumran, nestled in the stark beauty of the Judean desert. Please join me today on a virtual journey as we uncover the mysteries of this extraordinary archaeological site and explore its significance in both history and in our faith. Qumran holds a special place in history, offering insights into the lives of the people who once inhabited this remote desert outpost. Let's delve into the secretive community and unravel its stories one layer at a time. The ruins of Qumran stand as silent witnesses to a religious center still wrapped in mystery, where a community of zealots sought refuge in the desert solitude. Here, in the arid landscape, they built a sanctuary for spiritual contemplation and communal living. Many scholars even speculate that John the Baptist may have been influenced by the teachings and practices of the Qumran community and perhaps may have even been a part of the sect for a part of his life. John the Baptist's strong focus on baptism, repentance, and his lifestyle of self-denial and desert living mirror the Essene way of life. <laughs> of course, we really can't know if this is accurate, but it's a compelling theory. Among the remarkable discoveries at Qumran are its elaborate mikvahs, meticulously constructed for the ritual purification rites practiced by the community members. These sacred baths were used to serve as a physical and spiritual cleansing preparing individuals for their religious duties and their spiritual purity. Now, let's move on to what Qumran is most famous for, and it is astounding. The real treasure found at Qumran reads like a mystery novel. The year was 1947. In the rugged wilderness, a group of young shepherds played, their laughter echoing off the cliffs as they tossed rocks. One of them, very curious, hurled a stone into a hidden crevice, only to be met by a startling shadow. Their sense of adventure led them deeper into the cave. There, they found one of the greatest biblical discoveries in modern history in a cache of ancient clay jars hiding ancient scrolls. This treasure was about to set the world on fire. Their discovery ignited a chain of events leading to the scrolls falling into the hands of an antiquities dealer. But as word spread of the ancient texts, tensions rose. Bedouin treasure hunters and determined archaeologists descended upon the region, unearthing fragments of history from nearby caves. 
In the midst of this frenzy, the fate of the manuscripts often hung in the balance, sparking a dramatic race against time and greed. Over the years, further exploration of the surrounding caves uncovered additional scrolls and fragments, revealing a vast collection of religious texts. The Dead Sea Scrolls, carefully preserved for centuries, have allowed scholars to study the development of the Bible, unraveling the mysteries of ancient Judaism and even early Christian thought. Incredibly, the scrolls contain fragments from almost every book of the Old Testament. The remarkable preservation of the Dead Sea Scrolls has astonished experts with some texts nearly intact despite their age. They serve as a testament to the accurate transmission of God's Word over thousands of years. The Dead Sea Scrolls have also shed light on the historical context in which Jesus and early Christianity emerged, deepening our understanding of the New Testament. As we conclude our virtual tour of Qumran, let's take a moment to reflect on the profound legacy of this ancient site. From its humble beginnings as a desert refuge, to its pivotal role in shaping religious thought and practice, to showing us the integrity of the Word of God, Qumran continues to be one of the most significant sites in the lands of the Bible.
God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Once again, forget about me, just take it in. Okay, where are we now? I love the desert. I love the desert. The Hebrew word for desert is very interesting. 17 points, anyone? 17, yeah, somebody, yeah, there, Daryl. I think you got the most points up to now. All right. So, and what does it mean in Hebrew? God speaks. That's right. So you got 17 points each. Midbar comes from the Hebrew word davar, and that means that every time the desert is mentioned through the word midbar, what God is saying through that word is that the desert is the place where God speaks. Of course, He speaks everywhere, but it's something special with the desert. God brought his covenant people, the Jewish people, when they fled from Egypt, he brought them to what? The desert, before they were to go into the promised land. So the desert is a time when God speaks, perhaps on a deeper level. The desert is a season of preparation. The desert is as well a season of testing. Since if you look around, it's very beautiful, but it's also kind of brutal because it's pretty barren. So in the desert, you get aware of, if you don't understand that before you get into the desert, you're aware of here that you're totally, desperately dependent on the Lord. And that might be why the prophet Hosea, he says that he invites his people back into the desert to renew the covenant with them and to speak to them in a wonderful way. So uh, we are going to be now lots in the desert today, tomorrow evening, and we are going to drive and see Yam HaMelach the salt sea from the east side over there. And my prayer for you as you are here in the desert, that you would appreciate it and that you would take some quiet time. That is allowed here too. You could take one or two minutes. Just, you know, go by yourself a little bit and just stand there and, and just listen to the silence. The desert. God has a tendency sometimes to lead us in our lives into a desert. That might be the very season in our life when he 
does something profound on a deep level to prepare us for something new that is coming into our lives from the Lord. Another thing I hear with my eyes when I come to this place is the Bible. The Bible. Because this is perhaps one of the most significant historical, archaeological excavations in the world. In here, for example, they found a whole jar with the book of Isaiah. Totally, totally incredible. The oldest scrolls that we had, they, like uh, Danny was speaking about, Codex Aleppo, that was perhaps from the 10th century, and Codex Leningradensis, from perhaps the 11th century. That was the oldest text we had, scrolls, if you will, with the whole book of Isaiah. And now here we find a whole scroll with Isaiah, 66 chapters. You know, it's a pretty long book, right? And many people who want to discredit the Bible, they had great expectations. And they said, well, now we are going to see how things, how much things have changed in the Bible. We're going to find a totally different Bible here. Please remember, this is a text, a scroll from the book of Isaiah that I think comes from like third century before Christ. So we move more than 1,000 years back in time and we are only like 500 years after the prophet himself. That is incredible. And that is, you know, very, very highly rare, unique and unusual if you look at literature, the history of literature altogether. Because most of the time when you have famous historical writings, we do not have any scrolls from those books, the, 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 the original books. We have copy after copy after copy after copy after copy after copy. I get my mouth is twisting almost, you know. And then we have perhaps something that is like more than a thousand years after it was written. That's, even though it is the most famous historical books or the f most famous books in history, altogether, for example, in antique Greek history. So it's very normal that it is at least a thousand years between when it was written originally and from where we have an actual scroll. And often, if we compare scrolls with each other, there's big differences. That is what is the most common uh, uh, fact in literature history. Well, here now we find the whole scroll with Isaiah more than a thousand years back in time. And when the, they started to read the scroll, they were amazed, astonished, because it is extremely, to extremely high level, exactly the same text. Exactly the same text. Almost nothing has changed. That doesn't prove that Isaiah received everything from God himself, which we believe, but it proves that those people who copied the Bible, they were convinced that this was Holy Scripture and they were very careful and accurate in their way of, you know, making scroll after scroll after scroll after scroll. So one thing I hear here is about the Word of God. The accuracy of the Word of God, not the least the book of Isaiah. They have actually found at least parchments of scrolls, parts of scrolls from all Old Testament books, with one exception, Esther. Otherwise, they have small, at least, parchments from all Old Testament books. And not all books here, were in, or, or all scrolls here, were in such a good shape. Because the Roman soldiers, when they got here, 68, they got really disappointed. 
they hoped for, you know, they saw a jar in a cave or several jars and they were hoping for what? Gold. Something valuable. And it's only scrolls. <coughs> so I once, I once, uh, do you say conduct a marriage as a minister? I conducted a marriage. Performed. That for us, perform is like this, but okay. I performed the marriage. And the father to the groom, it was, to the groom, he was a scholar who worked with the Dead Sea Scrolls, a professional. One of the best in the world, I guess, because he got to work with the actual scrolls. He gave me a little picture how work here has been. I mean, they have found some scrolls as a whole, and that's easy, it gets easier. But so much that they have found here has been, you know, the Romans have torn it apart and it's been burning and it's been lying around uh, for 2,000 years. So, so he, he said to me, imagine that you have like uh, 200 puzzles and you tear away, you know, the cover that gives you the solution you, that you take away. And then you take all these pieces of, you take 50 or 200 puzzles and you take all these thousands of pieces of puzzles and you put them in a the big pile and you just mix them around. And then just so it should not be too easy, you, you burn up 70%. And then you throw it around. And then after 2,000 years, welcome, you know. It's puzzle solving time. The second thing I just want to briefly address here, that I hear with my eyes here, among many other things, is how God can use circumstances in our life. I think God leads us through prophetic anointing, prophetic greetings, through the anointing itself through wisdom, but also through circumstances, okay? And you saw the movie, right? I love that they added, you saw that, right? John the Baptist into the movie. And that is, you know, not just something that they came up with here, because there are many connections between what John the Baptist includes in his messages, in his teaching, if you will, compared to the things that they were fond of, often spoke about here in Qumran and among the Essenes as a general. This was a group, and you've heard this in the guiding already and, and in the museum, this was a group who withdrew, who lived in a way in isolation. The, the picture is not really that simple, we know from, from modern research, because they had a part of town in Jerusalem as well, but still. The, the, the idea here was to isolate because they thought that Jerusalem was becoming corrupt. So they needed to kind of isolate. And here they were what? They were living isolated, kind of un-Jewish in a way. And uh, at least many of them did not have a wife, which also very, very un-Jewish. We have found skeletons from, from actually kids and women around the compound. So perhaps the picture is a little bit more complex, but still the very center might have included many men who lived in celibacy. They were the sons of lights and everybody else was the son of darkness. They expected the Messiah to come very quickly. And uh, they believed in a great turmoil, the last war, the last battle. They actually had texts about two messiahs. One messiah, the high priest, and one messiah, David, the king. So they believed in the king messiah and the priest messiah, two persons. And we have the light darkness. We have the messiah coming soon. We have the priest, king, messiah. They stressed very much to live in purity. Uh, they stressed also a word called yachad. Did you read about that in the museum? Yachad. Can you say yachad? Lots of That means fellowship. That means communion. They lived here very close fellowship, very close communion. It was very, very important for them that they were close, 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 close to each other. And cleansing was very important here. Water 
We know how important it was for them to, to cleanse, uh, to, to be purified uh, several times a day. They really stressed that. Okay? Now, when John the Baptist comes, he seems also to be speaking about light and darkness. He seems also to be speaking about Messiah as uh, someone coming very soon. He seems also to be speaking about Messiah both as a priest and as a king, but only one person. He seems also to be coming, speaking about, you know, a dimension of judgment. And uh, the first church really stressed the yachad, right? The fellowship, the close fellowship, to live close together. And what was John the Baptist doing? He invited people to what? To be cleansed by water. Do you see all the connections? So we cannot prove that he was here, but for sure there are lots of, of things that m make you suspect perhaps God brought him here. But now, God used, therefore, one circumstance in his life that he was here. But God came, when the time came for God to really speak to him prophetically, God came with a very important, crucial, I would say, addition. And what was the addition? Well, we can read about it in Luke 3. And think about this. He went into all the vicinity of the Jordan. And that is right here. Right? The Jordan is just a couple of stones throws to that direction, north of the Yam HaMelach, the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. He went into all the vicinity of the Jordan, proclaiming, and listen to this, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And you know what he said in John 1, he said when the Messiah came, when Jesus came, look at the lamb that takes away the sins of what? The world. Now there is God's addition. It seems like the Holy Spirit told him, now you take all this purity, you take all this light, you take all this, you know, belief in the coming Messiah, priest, king, you, you take all this great expectation, you take also the severe parts, you know, the tough parts about that there is also going to be a judgment. You take the thing about cleansing and being prepared for the coming of the Messiah and to be, to be uh, uh, immersed in water. Now you take all that, but instead of keeping it, you know, for, for, for those who think that they are the only sons of light and, and that, that really think that they are the only ones who are righteous. Instead, you take all that and you go away and I will come with my spirit. And as you come to the Jordan River, I, you don't need Facebook, you don't need a smartphone, you don't need a PR campaign. I will get people to you and look at what groups John was called to minister the forgiveness of sins. Who got to take part of the purification water that up here only a small, small group got to take part of? We take a look at it. Uh, verse 7. He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Brother Wipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Here you have the, the that it still is a tough message, you know, there still is judgment. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. The axe, verse 9, is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And now listen, verse 10. What then should we do? The crowds were asking him. So the Holy Spirit leads him to minister and to give God's forgiveness and God's call to live a life, you know, filled with light and purity. Uh, God commands him to give that to the crowds, to everyone that wants to receive. He replied to them, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, and the one who has food must do the same. And now listen, it gets worse. Verse 12. Just, just imagine what the people here must have thought about this. I mean, the crowds, that was uh, terrible for them to do this with the crowds. And now comes, it gets worse. Verse 12, tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He told them, don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. So he ministers this purification water, this expectancy for the coming Messiah, this invitation really to the kingdom of God. He delivers that and gives it for free to the tax collectors. And it gets worse. <laughs> 
Now listen to verse 14. Some soldiers also questioned him. What should we do? He said to them, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. Now who were those soldiers? We don't know, but it doesn't say in the text that he was excluding Romans. It gets worse by the minute. <laughs> and this is beautiful because this is about God's grace, his love for everyone. Also judgment, also, you know, it's time to live a life in expectancy for the Messiah. Now, you know, confess your sins and sin no more, as Jesus said to the women who committed adultery. But God's grace, the Lamb who took away the sins, he took away the sins not only for this group, he took away the sins of the world. So this might sound very trivial to you. Please excuse me for this. But a, a, a very, very, you know, everyday example compared to all this. But it's kind of to try to break it down to your, to your uh, where you live and, and, and circumstances. Okay? So God can use your circumstance, something in your life that you didn't think this is not connected to God. This is not connected to me being a Christian. You know, I just work at the coffee shop. That's not part of me being a Christian. I just have a job at the coffee shop, you know. But what if God all of a sudden just uses that? I have a friend, believe it or not, a woman who leads music in our congregation. And she's, she, she is often at our house. She's a dear friend to me and my wife. And like, I think it's 12 years ago, she just told us, we know her very closely, and her parents, that she was, uh, she, I think she was turning 40 perhaps, and she said, I, I would like a dog. That's what I want for present. So we gave her a dog. And now you go, oh, dog, what has a dog to do with this place, you know? Well, she didn't think that would have anything to do with Christ or, or, or a circumstance that God would use. She thinks, I just want to, because she had a longing. You can have a long and you don't think it has to anything to do with God. It's okay, you know, you can have a dog, but, you know, it's not part of something God is going to use. But she got that dog. We bought one. We went with her and we bought the dog and her parents, we, we shared. And, you know, she started to come with testimonies to us. You know what's so strange? I was out today with my dog and I met a couple of people. I would never have met them otherwise. And we started to talk about, you know, everyday life and the dogs and we had and all that, you know. And as the dogs were there <laughs> being together, we started to talk about Christ. And all of a sudden I told them, you know what, I'm a musician in our congregation, you want to come, uh, we have a meeting uh, on, on Saturday, it's called a service, or Sunday, it's called a service, you want to, you want to join? And you know, she just met more and more people only by going around with her dog. And several people have become saved. God has used that to get them to church. So isn't God creative? So he can use a circumstance in your everyday life. Perhaps when John the Baptist was here, we're feeling like, you know, lots of things are good there, but some things are pretty awkward. And all of a sudden he can take that circumstance and use it for his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you brought us to the desert today. And Lord, if we have desert in our lives, I, I pray that you would just bless us in our desert. Lord, and that you would speak to us in our desert, the parts of our life that are desert. Thank you that you are in total control as always. And Lord, thank you for the Bible being your very word. Thank you for the, for the finding here of the whole scroll of Isaiah. That was so accurate. And Lord, now we pray that you would use our circumstances. Please show us, Lord, if there's anything in our life we didn't think it had anything to do with you. Please show us if you want to use a circumstance in our life for the glory of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us not only when we go to church on Sunday, you are with us and you lead us and you want to use us 24-7. To you, Father, in Christ's name we pray. And the congregation said, Amen. Thank you for joining us at Qumran. Hans shared the story about the worship leader in his congregation using an everyday circumstance. I mean, a dog, who'd a thunk, right? But God used this dog to bring people to faith. So it may be that God is asking you today, what are your everyday circumstances that I can use for my glory? What in your lives or situations have you maybe overlooked that I can use to share my love with people? Let's take a quiet moment now 
to ask God to reveal to us our everyday circumstances that He can use to bring others into a relationship with Him or to bless others who need help in Jesus' name. Let's quietly consider this now. If you have not already done so, please go to breakforth.org to download the accompanying Bible study for this video. And if you would like to support this series to enable us to share this for free around the world, please prayerfully consider a gift by visiting breakforth.org. Until next time. May God richly bless you and may he break forth in wonderful ways of love, peace, and purpose in your life and in the lives of others.